All right, welcome to the next lesson from Delta Peng at Tech Peng. This is, let's see, what is this? Oops. This is, wait, making sure, making sure it's recording. Okay. This is the lesson on basic Linux usage and tips. So we talked a little bit about the command lines, right? The command line windows and how they're, um, how they're kind of different ones. There's the Windows, the Windows command, kind of a very basic one. There's also another Windows version called PowerShell, has more functionality to it. And the one I like to use is the git bash, and it's Linux-like. And even though Linux has a different style and way of doing things, um, I think it's useful. It's useful to learn it. It's a very good skill to have, especially as you get further in your programming career. Um, because if you ever work with like servers, um, those servers are typically going to be um, Linux based. Yeah, because uh, when you're we're working on command line type commands, right? You're Let's see, you're not working with the standard GUI interface. So you, you don't have like the nice, you know, browser windows or, you know, like we talked about the classic calculator button or calculator program where you can press buttons. This kind of thing isn't on, on this, right? It's all like text-based. And so because of that, you know, it's not, not as easy to use, but it's a lot more lightweight so when it comes to things like business servers or or later on when we learn about like Docker containers, um, they want to try to keep things as lightweight as possible. Uh, plus, it will also mean, you know, less resources used and cheaper, uh, cheaper to use. Because for businesses, they'll have, um, there's something called the cloud, right? And there's, there's the internet and then the cloud is kind of like, it's kind of like the internet, but when they refer to cloud, they're usually talking about like um, a collection of like servers that you can use. Um, like so, small businesses can pay for pay for their website to be on the cloud or on someone else's server. Um, but in order to do that, you can either get the Linux servers, which is um, which is a lot cheaper because uh, the Linux OS is free, or if you get the Windows server, they'll charge you quite a bit more for it. Um, because they have, you know, the proprietary software. Um, as an example, like their prices are usually like 0 .00 something cents a minute. Um, so it might be like 0, .0 just for 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 ease ease of use in the example. It might be like zero zero one one cents for like a Linux box, and then it might be point zero zero one four for like a Microsoft box. So it might not seem like a lot, but you know, there's there's a lot of minutes in the year. I mean, we can even okay, there's 60 minutes in an hour, 24 hours in a day, 365 days a week. So okay. So if we did like what was it? Point zero zero one. So like if there's like a point zero 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 three difference. Okay, that still accounts for like a hundred fifty-seven dollar difference by the end of the year, and and when it comes to cloud, it's like every, you know, that's like that would be like the bare minimum server. If you wanted like, oh, you want a server with a decent amount of hard drive space, well, that's going to cost you an extra, you know, point zero zero something cents a minute, which you know might not seem like much, but it adds up over the year. And that's like whether you're using it or not, they're still going to charge you for it, as long as you reserve those resources they charge you. So that's uh, not not ideal if if you can like. So that's why if you can use Linux and you can you know avoid the the GUI stuff, then then you know you can use less resources and it'll be quite a bit cheaper for you long term. So that's that's one of the reasons why. Um, well, why do we gotta learn all this text-based stuff, and why can't we just use the beautiful GUIs? And that's that's one of the reasons why. 
Um, but you know, like these command lines can do some pretty cool things at the same time. So, okay, this is the React website from last time, right? Uh, so if I press Control C, I, I go over here, I click on this window, so the focus is on this window. I Control C to cancel. Okay, so the can the program's canceled. Um, this website's still running, kind of, because it's in memory. But if I try to reload it, it's going to give me an error because it's not actually running anymore. I stopped it, right? So if you give it a little time, yep, unable to connect. It can't. You can't find localhost 30,000. Okay, but just an example of some basic commands. Um, you know, like like anything else, it just takes some time to get familiar with. But you can run stuff like, say, history. Oh, and it gives us a list of commands that we've run so far on this uh, on this machine with this user. So history command npm start code not. So that's a good way if you forgot something, you can you can check it out. A very useful command is um, I think it's called a reverse search. So you press Control R. Well, in this box, okay. Now it says reverse I search, right? So if I type in something like uh, n, so n, so now it's it's going backwards in time and it's searching my history and trying to find a match for for this command. So n, so it found one at 17. And so let's say if I say if I press Control R again, it'll go backwards and it'll look for the next match. Where did he n? Okay, so he found a match on 12. So now it's, it spits out this command for me. It's like, oh, is it this one that you want? I'm like, oh, no, that's still not quite it. So Control R, Control R. Okay, this one, this is the one I want. So then I can just press like Enter to run it. Or if I wanted to cancel out, if I was searching for something like, uh, what was that command to see where I was at? Present working direct, oh, there it is, PWD. So I can either, you know, I could press Control C if I want to cancel it and if I don't actually want to run it. So this is kind of like, okay, control C, the, oh, the upper carrot, and then C. But yeah, that's something. And if you accidentally run a program, you don't mean to control C to try to stop and cancel it early. All right, so that's that's a huge, huge thing, and it's very, very useful. Because um, then you can run existing commands, and again, um, you don't have to worry about mistyping it. Um, Kind of mentioned before, if you're okay, ls ls to see the files. But another thing you can do is, so ls is the command, but you can add flags to it. It's like if I did a whoop, did a you know like a dash and then a, that's one of the flags. Okay, so it did a little added a little thing added something to it. If I do Oh, and I think I mentioned before, if I do up and down, it'll give me, so it's going It's going on a list of, okay, wait a minute, I'll put history again so you can see the list. So I press up, okay, that's the last command, that's 22. If I press up again, now it's 21, 20, 19, 18. Okay, if I press down, then it goes, you know, back down, so okay, 19, 20, 21. And so that's also a good way to recall your old commands. Um, let's see, control C to cancel. Okay, so ls, a, if I do dash al, so that means it's two flags, the a and the l flag, whatever that might mean. Okay, it's given me more information compared to if I just did ls, right? And it did it in a different format. It looks like, yeah, I kind of structured the format a little bit differently, and now it's given me uh, March 30th. That's probably date modified or date created. Uh, this is the size. No, 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 which one's the size? Uh, well, one of these is the size. What's this number? Huh. Well, this is something else. Not quite sure. And this is like the owner of the file. And this is permissions on the file. We don't really need to go too much over that. But it's like, if it has a D, it's a directory or a folder. RWX stands for read, write, execute. So it's like the permissions, the first three are our permissions for or the second, third, and fourth are permissions for like admin. The next three are ad permissions for like the owner. And I think the next three are permissions for everyone else. So everyone else has read and execute access. The owner has read and execute access. 
and the admin has read write execute access and this is the folder okay um, if you ever need to change stuff like that there's change mod for changing permissions change own for changing the owner um, yeah that's more you won't you won't need it for any of this stuff but for like if you're working on the server um, those commands are useful okay aside from dash al if I do dash al h so h means human readable and then it gives me okay yeah now I know for sure this is the file size here so instead of like you know how 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 big a file is that six looks like a lot and then it kind of simplifies it oh this is 660 kilobytes okay okay so not too bad here but if it was something more like you know I meant the video files so right click git bash if I'm at the video files and I'm trying to find out oh how much you know what's the file size you can't easily read how much that is right so if I do dash alh okay that's 168 megabytes so much better you could do stuff like df for disk free and then dash h to make it human readable and here's like okay here's the computer itself uh, looks like I have 415 gigabytes available and I've used 61 so far on this computer so 13% of it is in use so let's see yeah that's the gist of some of the commands um, if you do cat that's basically a way to echo text out so cat cat test is gonna read it then. is that right or echo echo test okay yeah echo test just spits it out let me think okay cat it spits it out but it needs to be an existing file so let's see so I did re and then tab because it'll fill out the rest of it re cat okay so now it spit out all the text of the file is that the same text let's see oops Okay, okay. Let me go back to it. One git. Um, examples. Read me. So, what's the default read me file? Getting started with create React app. Yep, getting started with create React app. So, it's same, it just spits out the content. So, that's nice if you're on. Again, you're on the server. If you're like Visual Studio's code is nice for seeing the code like this, right? But this is part of this is a program that creates a GUI window. If you're on a server and you need to look at some code on it, you can't rely on this because it can't generate it that GUI for you. So instead, you have to do something like find the file and then sort of get used to reading the non-colored plain text. It's a little bit tough but they do have some other things like programs to help you read that'll help you read and edit text like vim okay so now this one gives it a bit of color but vim takes a little practice to understand because you have to do like um like to escape you have to do oh. see there's like a little command line window here so to, to escape you have to do colon Q or to save you have to do colon W or to start typing something you have to press I first so if I do that hey now I'm in insert mode now I can oh here I am now I can type stuff in if I press escape then I, I exit insert mode and then when I'm in this mode if I do stuff like if I press DD it'll delete delete the whole line or I can D, let me buy D, 3D, then it deletes three lines. D, 5D deletes five lines. Stuff like that. So if you know what you're doing, it can be kind of useful, a useful way to manage text. But it's kind of, you know, it's kind of confusing otherwise. Um, it takes time to get the hang of. So I'm going to go, okay, escape. Where am I at? Yep. I'm trying to quit here. Okay, 
So, okay, colon, quit. I'm gonna, I don't wanna save it. I was just doing some examples. So quit, colon, Q. It says it won't let me because it realizes there was a change. So it's like, hey, if you're sure you wanna quit, use the exclamation mark to override. I say, okay, so colon, Q, exclamation mark, and that'll quit without saving. If I wanted to save it, I could do something like write, or I could do write and quit. Okay, I'm just gonna quit. All right, is there anything else? Hmm. Oh, okay, let's see. If you ever get a permission issue, sometimes you can run it with sudo first in order to execute it, but that's like running with elevated privileges. So you don't wanna do that like on a program unless you're unless it's a program you know that you wanna run. But if it's something like, hey, I need to copy a file, if I do cp for copy, so cp copy readme, and then I wanna copy it as, I'll do readme again, readme two. So, so if I press enter here, copy this file into this file name and path. So I press enter and then, yep, so this copy the file and put it here. So I did it from this command line and then, yeah, and then it, it did it. But sometimes if you don't, if you're not the owner, it might not want you to do it. And in cases like that, then a sudo would be acceptable, prefixing it so that you can just uh, get around some of that permission stuff. Um, and the, if you want to move the file and rm to remove it. So rm readme2. Yep. So I got rid of it there. And you don't, again, you don't need to know too much, but in the future it could be useful. Uh, as an example, give me a second. Let me, I need to get some uh, credentials. Let me pause them. Okay, testing. All right, we're back in. So as an example, I wanted to do it, type my password in beforehand. So one other command you can run is something called SSH. It'll be a common one if you are working with servers or other stuff. And that's the way to shell into a server. Secure shell, I think that's what it stands for. And it's be a username, and then at, and then an IP address. IP address is essentially like a location, uh, an address location for a device. That could be a computer, that could be a cell phone, um, a Bluetooth speaker, perhaps. Anything that can kind of connect to the router would have like a IP address assigned to it. And, and so if you have like username, IP address, and you say, hey, I want to shell into that place, it'll ask you for a password and other stuff. And if you get it right, then okay. So now I'm actually, here's, now I'm actually on a server. So this was me on my local machine. This tells you, hey, user, this is your user, and this is at your, at in this case, local machine. In this case, now it says, hey, now your user Delta thing, and your this is the computer that you're on, or the server. Okay, so let me think. Let's see, let's try the disk free command again. So oh, now I got a different result. It's, um, I have, okay, this looks like the main one. Uh, 800, 187 gigs free, and I'm using 36% or 36 gigs of it. So 240 total roughly. Okay, interesting. So, but this is, this is pretty crazy, right? This is all of a sudden I'm talking to a different computer. So I still have to, you know, do it through the command line, through the text-based thing. But, you know, this, all this stuff outside is my local computer, and this is like a window into like the server, or my other, the remote computer. So anything I run here, like the commands I run here is running on that other machine now instead of on my machine. So that's, yeah, that's kind of crazy. And that's how like, you know, like websites are hosted on other computers and other, you know, computers slash servers, right? Or AKA servers. So let's see what kind of things. 
here and you can tell okay I like I like that data structure that I have so with Tim data I have I have docker container stuff here ls and so I, you know regularly you use ls to see some different kind of um, see the different things that are here I have some secure certificate information I have some nginx reverse proxy And then from here, you can do stuff like, well, let me think. So I'm running a control R reverse search command because I don't always remember. Again, I don't remember everything, all the commands. Let's think, um, okay, actually, how about talk point? Okay. Okay, this is, uh, now I'm on, on my server, I'm on on a SQL, a Postgres SQL instance uh, in a Docker container. So what is this? This is basically, I'll give you an example. This is one of the websites that I have. And it doesn't look the prettiest, I'll give you that, but it's more so, well, just try to get functionality in, try to get functionality in and try to, what do you wanna call it? Yeah, just to kind of like experiment with React, see what I can do with it. Um, this original idea came with trying to create a conversation generator, I guess you could say. It randomly selects a, a generate a randomly a randomly selects a preset talking point as a way to help encourage conversation. Uh, so, as an example, you could say like a compliment. And then it picks up, okay, nine, looks like nine different entries. And these are bootstrap cards. It's like, oh, you know, you're someone who's reason to smile. Your creative potential seems limitless and you can like it and you can flag it. And you press the get talking points. It'll give you a new set of nine and then a new set of nine. Or let's say, you know, would you rather, you know, would you rather have nicknames or not? Would you rather go bald or be forever cursed to have terrible haircuts? Would you rather have a magic carpet that flies or a see-through submarine? Ooh, that's a good one. And so a lot of these, um, I, I picked up information from different sites and then kind of collected it. And I put it into my SQL database. And we talked about the random thing, right? You can like randomly select songs, um, right? The, the VLC media player can do that. So what I did is I got you know a bunch of talking points, categorized them, I put them in my own SQL server with like a table called like topic or something like that, and yeah, and then now you know, categorize them, and then now you can randomize and, and spin them back out, and that's like a practical use, a practical use and idea of that. But hey, we talked a little bit about SQL too, right? So this is the SQL server. Well, this is the SQL server where this data is coming from. Let's see, uh, as an example, normally you wouldn't see this data, but I kept it up anyway, and it's good for debugging. So, okay, um, let's let's take a look. So I'm in Postgres, a command you can use is slash D, backslash D, so here's a list of tables. Uh, based on these tables, and this is the talk point server, uh, SQL server database. And so I'm gonna say the table is topic, most likely, select everything from topic. Okay, there's a bunch. If I press enter, it'll keep on going down. Okay, I'm gonna queue to quit, that's a lot. So how about select count of everything from topic? Okay, so of all the entries here, of all these entries, looks like I have 1,446 of them. Okay, um, well how about ID, how about this? Backslash D, um, it was called tables called topic. Okay, so this is a way to describe the, describe the table for me. Okay, oh here we go. And there's we have an ID. The way that this is set up, here's the column names: ID, type ID, answer likes. Okay, okay, ID. That's a type of integer. Okay, content, which is a string that could be up to 400 characters. Let's see if we can improve this. Okay. ID 3950 is supposed to be, would you rather lose your arm or leg? So let's see if that's true. Select 
everything from topic where ID equals uh, 3950, right? And here's the record it returned for me. 3950, it's a type ID 3, so 3 must be equal to would you rather, yeah, would you rather lose your arm or leg? And I'm the one who entered it. So there, there's the proof. The proof is in the pudding right there. But that's a practical example of, again, some of the stuff that I was showing you earlier. Here, there's SQL. Here's how it actually connects. I built the website from React. And then, oh, I guess I haven't told you yet how to how to connect this data to the SQL server. That, that would also be a big thing that you need to know. But aside from that, like, you know, a lot of the, all the building blocks are kind of there, or at least you have the tools necessary to, the environment set up to be able to start testing and figure this stuff out. Um, I guess you don't have this though. This is like a server that, uh, a server I set up. You could use the cloud, but um, if you can set up your own server, it's a lot cheaper. And that, that takes more effort though. It took a while to figure this out. Um, but yeah, but you can see, but that could be maybe, maybe a topic for the future. But you can see how the pieces are starting to fit together, right? This is the back end. This is the back end server. This is the remote machine that saves the data. This is the front end, the nice thing that the user sees. And then it's porting, when you call the website, it ports the data um, to it. Okay. And you need to know command lines so you can kind of navigate the server and manage some of this. Or if you have your own server, if you, if you do that. But it's kind of cool to see the whole picture though. All right, exit. So connection closed. And so now I'm not at this IP address anymore. Now I'm back on my local machine. All right. And that will be all for this video.